Good morning. Pastor Sean here. Today is Monday, April 1st, and this is your morning prayer. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, today we have the parable of the wedding feast. And this is found in two Gospels, uh, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, and Luke 14, chapter uh, verses 16 through 24. Now we're going to look at the um, the Matthew version of the parable because um, the the Matthew version has a kind of a an epilogue that the Luke version doesn't have, or or a second it's not really an epilogue, um, but a, a second component to it that Luke's gospel does not have. So, parable of the wedding feast, Matthew twenty two one through fourteen. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may, can be, may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all, who, all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now that's where Luke cuts off. Okay, so this... This portion is what Matthew includes. But when the king came to, in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Alrighty. So, the the main part of the parable, the part that um, both Matthew and Luke have versions of, and and this the, the the first part of the parable is virtually identical in in both. There's a few um, there's a little bit of wording difference in in some of the sentences, but um, the the parable parable is virtually the same. So um, this one's pretty fr straightforward in that um, again we have another salvation history, people of Israel history kind of thing. Where, um, you know, he's the, the, the king, the master of the house, um, is, is preparing this wedding feast. And whenever there's like a wedding feast, uh, scripturally speaking, we're thinking of Christ and his church. We're thinking um, the, the, when Christ comes again to usher in the resurrection, you know, what, what, what is inaugurated and then begins then is, is the wedding feast of, of the lamb, right? So, uh, but Christ and his church is always, you know, he is the bride, uh, bridegroom, church is his bride. So, um, the, the initial guests were invited to this, to this wedding feast. So we'd look at that and say, okay, this is God calling his chosen people, calling Israel and saying, okay, be my people. Believe me, I will send you, you know, a savior who will, who will save you from your sin, yada, yada, yada. And always looking ahead to that, that ultimate culmination of all things is, is the wedding feast. So they were invited. Um, but then what happens is he sent servants to say, hey, we're, 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 we're getting ready. <laughs> the the dinner, dinner's prepared. Um, you know, it's, it's time. And they made excuses. They didn't want to come. They, they treated the, the servants shamefully and killed them, which is, you know, the uh, history of how the people dealt with the prophets, uh, whenever the prophets came and, and called them to repentance. Um, and, and so this is just how things were, had been going. Um, so what happens then is uh, the king was angry and um, he sent his troops and destroyed the murderers and burned their city. Now, um, you know, with the destruction of the city, we could look at this and, and, and see, like, well, we see Jerusalem is destroyed uh, by Rome. Um, so definitely looking to that, although uh, 
the well let's just <laughs> leave that there and then we'll jump to the ne next portion um so he, you know that um he says like okay well i'm i'm done so now i'm going to open it up um and he says go out and, and invite everybody anybody you find and so what we see here is is where um you know once christ comes dies rises ascends then the gospel goes out and now the the gentiles the Gentiles who hear the word and who believe are now grafted in. And so they are the ones now re receiving the invitation. Now, truly, the, the invitation goes out to everybody. Um, you know, he says, go out and whoever you find, just grab them and, and pull them in. So, um, so yeah, we could, you, you see a lot of these kind of images coming together with the um, salvation history, the people of Israel, Jerusalem being you know, destroyed, and now the Gentiles being brought in. So that's where both parables are are alike. The second component of Matthew is probably where it gets a little bit more interesting because it comes with some different interpretations. And this is where, um, so all these people are brought in and the king comes and examines his guests and he finds a man without a wedding garment. He says, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? Um, and the man was speechless. And so the, the king tells the attendants, bind him, cast him out into the outer darkness. So what I've heard more probably often than not is this idea that, um, that, that appeals to kind of the, this ancient custom where a king would, um, would give the wedding guests a wedding garment to wear. Um, and so the implication being is that the king made, so bringing in all these people to the wedding feast would have given them a garment to wear and this person chose not to wear it. So very disrespectful, and in the context of um, theologically speaking, we, we would say like, okay, so the Gentiles are now brought in, and now he, he's coming to look at everybody, and, and we'd say this is probably at the on that last day, this day of judgment, and he, he sees one of the wedding guests who's not wearing a garment, so somebody who received the invitation, um, but they, they rejected the clothing, you know, so they rejected their faith, they rejected, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, apostatized, whatever, rejected their faith. It's the easier way to put it. Um, and, and so that's, you know, very, very nice and clean. That's how that works. The only problem with that is the, um, there's virtually no, um, evidence of that being a normal, uh, custom. I, I believe there's like maybe one or two or a very, very, very few, examples where this might have happened but it really isn't in, in no way a normal kind of like oh yeah everybody in the ancient world knew that this is how it worked um it just it, it doesn't work like that um so what we have here then is like okay well the wedding king came in and, and look at his yes so the invitation goes out people are brought in okay cool now you're you're, you're brought into the, the wedding feast awesome we're, we're getting things ready. Are, are you good to go? Okay. Well, he sees somebody who's not wearing a wedding garment, who is not prepared. So, okay, we have have somebody who received the invitation but has not dressed themselves accordingly. They have not prepared themselves. Okay. And when he says, friend, how did you get in here with a wedding garment? Here's kind of the key to this. The man was speechless. Uh, the man didn't try to make any sort of um, plea, didn't ask for forgiveness, um, didn't have anything to say. I mean, literally, he was speechless. And so this really becomes um, a case where it's like, yeah, we, you know, we, there, there is, <laughs> we are saved by grace alone. You know, we're, we're, we're saved. It's not of our own works. It is God doing it. Absolutely. Okay. Wonderful. However, um, we, we still must be prepared. And, and even though we are invited to the feast, if we, if we are not um, prepared, i.e., you know, fostering this faith and, and, and clinging to it and, and even, you know, and, and producing the fruit of faith, well, then we aren't worthy to come into this banquet. And, you know, basically what we'd be doing is looking at uh, James, the book of James, where James says, you know, faith without works is dead. This is always a fun one to deal with um, because the reality is like, well, yeah, um, the, the works that, that are a fruit of faith are kind of like a, a heartbeat for us. You know, it's, it's the best way sometimes that we have 
to see if if faith is still alive because we can't actually see faith. We can hear and we can judge based on, on a confession that somebody makes. So if somebody confesses, I believe in Jesus Christ, awesome, good. There's faith. Um, however, if we look at, at the fruit of that person's confession, what are they doing? How are they living? Um, you know, are they living completely contrary to everything Christ says? If they are, then we'd have to suspect that that confession is probably not true. That, you know, with without that fruit of faith, it looks like that faith is dead. And so for, for this person, you know, we would say like, okay, well, if he, he wasn't wearing the wedding garment and he had nothing to say, like there was no response that he could make, no apology, no nothing, um, then it would be kind of a James situation here where we say, well, it looks like he does not have the fruit of that faith. You know, he doesn't have the fruit of that invitation. And so he was cast out. Um, so the idea is, and then there is an expectation here that, you know, when, when you come to faith, you know, you're not going to strangle the Holy Spirit. You know, we would say that, you know, we would expect somebody to grow in good works when they become a believer. Um, not because they have to in order to, you know, maintain their salvation or anything like that, but that's just, it's how faith operates. Faith produces these good works. Um, and when we, when we don't, it is a case where we are actively getting in the way of that, that we are, um, you know, uh, minimizing the spirit's work and, and even trying to prevent that in order to, you know, let our flesh lead the way. And so you basically have a situation in, in the um, longer version of this parable in Matthew where um, we see like, yeah, even the, the first batch of guests were, were, were cast out because they rejected the invitation. Well, it doesn't automatically mean that everybody else who receives the invitation is in no matter, you know, like, oh, you, well, they lost out. So everyone else who gets the invitation, come on, you're in. It's like, well, yeah, the invitation goes out, but still you have to receive the invitation and, and you know, have that fruit of faith. Um, you know, just because somebody is, is called a Christian, you know, oh, I grew up Christian. It's like, great. Okay, well, do you go to church now? No. Oh, like. Do you read scripture? Do you read the word of God? No. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, there, there are these, these uh, components to it that are, are kind of vital um, to our life of faith. So went over a little bit there, but um, had to explain a little extra. So let me know if you have any um, comments, questions about this one. This is one that I, I um, often get most of like, oh, wow, I've, I've never, you know, that's, that's, I've always heard it that the king gives the wedding garments. So if you, if you do have any questions, be sure to let me know. Let us pray. I thank you, my heavenly father, through Jesus Christ, your dear son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands, I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Blessings to you on this uh, this first Monday after Easter, by the way. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Have a wonderful day. Um, hope your day goes well. Hope your week starts off well. And I will see you tomorrow. So until then, peace be with you.